Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. What the heck? What are we doing? We're going to record a TV, a uh, radio, a uh, podcast. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah, it's a, we're recording something. Welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator and host. With me as usual is my good friend and co-host, Scott Hemingway. Hello to all of our wonderful, wonderful listeners. Isn't that nice? It is. They're great. I've met every single one of them, so I can qualify that. You also have trouble with telling the truth. Well, I have trouble just with my brain in general. Here's our disclaimer. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. Now, this one I want to hit hard on because I get some emails every week saying we did stuff wrong and we should cover things differently and we should say these mm -hmm. things and mention these other things. We are not experts on no. the topics we present, no. nor are we journalists. Uh -uh. We're two ordinary Canadians chatting about crime and the dark side of history. There's a lot of wonderful podcasts that are done by journalists. Yes. We are not And they're one. fantastic, and we are not one. Let's get to it. Put on your toque. Grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Chomp, 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 chomp. This is episode 80. Woo! And this episode is being released on July 1st, Canada Day, our dun, national dun, holiday. Dun. Yeah, there you I go. I totally forgot that we have a holiday coming up, so that means I'll have Monday off work. There you go. Woo! So right now, we would like you to remove your toques and stand with us, if it's safe for you to do so. Hand over heart as we observe our national anthem. That gets me in the feels every single time. I, you know, not to sound like just some um, blind patriotic fool, but I am yeah, our national anthem. I love, mm -hmm. and it gets me in the feels. It gets me in the feels. It too. Gets me in the feels right in them. So people ask, why do we celebrate so close to America's Independence Day, July Fourth? Are we copying them? Clearly, no. Sorry, folks, it's a mere coincidence. What on July first, eighteen sixty-seven? 
The British North America Act, today known as the Constitution Act of 1867, created Canada as we know it, without Newfoundland, of course. So, this is why July 1st is important to us. It was actually officially named Dominion Day until 1982, when the name was changed to Canada Day. Really? I I don't ever remember hearing Dominion Day, and trust me, I was alive in 1982. I remember hearing Dominion Day. I don't don't remember hearing it being referred to as that. Well, Hmm. how old were you in 82? Uh, Eight. Yeah, there you go. So maybe you weren't absorbing that kind of stuff quite yet. It wouldn't have been important to you. No, no. Well, you would think as a you you would remember these things at that age because like yeah I don't ever go to school, <laughs> right? But no, I don't remember Dominion Day. Canadians across the country and around the world show their pride in their history and cultural achievements. It's been a day of celebration where many festivities are held across the country since 1868. So since the first it. anniversary, yeah. yeah. There will be parades, parties, picnics, and pyrotechnics. It's a lot of peas. Yes. It's alliteration in the Mm -hmm. way of fireworks. So we have fireworks too. Yes. Yes. Uh, It should be a time for reflection for modern Canadians too. Mm -hmm. We still have a long way to go. We've made some mistakes along the way, some of which we'll talk about today. Our nation's willingness to admit our wrongs, attempt to make amends for the harms done, and change direction to correct our course is part of what makes our country one of the greatest places in the world to live. I totes agree, my man. And like I mentioned, we still have a lot left to do. Yep. But I, for one, am proud to live in the country that we do. Oh, absolutely. I am such a proud Canadian. Yeah. Obviously, we do a fully Canadian podcast, so it would help if we were actually proud Canadians. And apparently, I have a very Canadian accent that I didn't realize until New Orleans that everybody, one person was constantly pointing out, oh, you just said that. I said, darn. And speaking of proud Canadian, I used to buy booze called Royal Reserve, and it had a sticker on the back that said, I'm a proud Canadian, Hmm. with a little Canadian flag on it on a black background. And I used to have them stuck all over things. (laughs) But I saw a guy with a truck one time back in Nova Scotia, and the whole back window was covered with these little stickers. And it would have taken probably about 400 bottles to. Oh, my fuck. (laughs) Right? So that guy was a very proud and probably drunk Canadian. Oh, my God. Wow. Yeah. That's what you want in a vehicle. A a drunk. Because that means there was booze in a vehicle, whether it was consumed in the vehicle. Well, you don't necessarily know know exactly, but you had to have had the booze near the vehicle. At some point. Yeesh. Before we get into the main subject of the show, we have a giveaway for you. Our friend and true crime author, Alan R. Warren, has a special giveaway for us this week. The first 24 listeners to email Alan at radiocub at gmail.com, that's cub with two Bs, with deadly betrayal in the subject line, will receive a copy of his book about Jennifer Pan called Deadly Betrayal, the True Story of Jennifer Pan, Daughter from Hell. She was the subject of Dark Poutine, episode number 49, and I used Alan's book in the research for the episode. Thanks again, Alan. You can learn more about Alan and his other work at his website, somethingweirdmedia.com. Let's get on with the show. This might be a controversial episode for some. Uh, Some people might find what they're about to hear tough to listen to, as it may shatter long-held beliefs of the man they may hold in highest regard. Mm Mm-hmm. We want to shed light on our country's history and historical figures, warts and all. We'll share the facts as we have found them, many from the man's own mouth. He kept extensive diaries. In no way do we mean to disparage the life of service this person dedicated to Canada in times of national and global strife. Correct. He helped to make this great country what it is today, regardless of his faults. This telling exists as a snapshot Of another time. Which I think is an important thing to recognize. Yeah. It doesn't excuse the behavior. Oh my God. But it is behavior that might have been looked at a lot differently at the time. Absolutely. Rather than ignore mistakes in favor of the accomplishments only, we feel we can learn more about our country through an unflinching look at its past. Only through humble acceptance of our entire history, good and bad, can we hope to learn from it and never repeat certain parts of it. I, I think that's a really, really important 
important point to bring up because, yeah, this isn't about trying to tarnish anybody's name, but I think we have to also acknowledge that we do have some negative parts in our history. Yes, absolutely. That we can't just gloss over right. and paint as some utopia. It's important for us to know uh, our actual past. Ask our indigenous listeners oh. how they feel about colonialism, for one. Oh, dear God. Yeah. That's a whole other show. That is a whole other show, and it will be a topic on Dark Poutine yeah. at some point. Yeah. I just have to get the right people to come and talk to us about it. Yeah. The subject of this episode is the life and times of Canada's longest-serving Prime Minister, William Lyon Mackenzie King, commonly known as Mackenzie King. He was also probably the most eccentric and enigmatic man to hold the post as well. As his diaries and subsequent post-mortem biographies revealed, he had a hidden and strange personal life, one worth talking about. For example, he believed he could communicate with the dead and supernatural forces with the help of his dreams, visions, and seances often facilitated by mediums of the day. He claimed he spoke with dead relatives, his mother and grandfather, other politicians, and even a few of his own deceased dogs. He wrote about contact with other notable historical figures, including Leonardo da Vinci. Before we get into the truly weird stuff, just who was Mackenzie King, the man whose face now graces our $50 bill? I'm very curious to learn, Mike. Over three terms at crucial points in our nation's history, King served as Prime Minister of Canada and longtime leader of the Liberal Party. The tenth person elected to the position, he was PM from 1921 to 26, 26 to 30, and 1935 to 48, throughout the entirety of World War II. Oh, so damn near, damn near 20 years. He led the country for an impressive 21 years and 154 days in that office. Wow. McLean's magazine published an article in 1997 where political scholars ranked Mackenzie King at the top of the heap of all of Canadian prime ministers, even over such luminaries of Canadian leadership as Sir Wilfrid Laurier and Canada's first PM, Sir John A. Macdonald. Okay, this is fascinating already. As a youngster, his motto was help those who cannot help themselves. This led him to his studies of law and social work, eventually earning him five university degrees. Wow. He is the sole Prime Minister to receive a PhD, and that came from Harvard in the Ooh. States. Oh, wow. Although involved in the development of the Canadian welfare state, he did not see himself as a socialist. He's the reason we have employment insurance today and also the old age pension. Okay, so there's pretty, pretty important things to our society up here. Absolutely. He claimed his ideas were rooted in his Presbyterian upbringing mm. and continued practice of Christian values. Okay. In 1944, King's government passed the National Housing Act into law, making mortgages more affordable at the time. Okay, yeah, great things. As well as seeing Canada through rough times, the forward-thinking King helped to lead our country from a mere British colony toward independence within the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. King and his government allowed Canada to evolve into the autonomous nation we have become, now well-respected on the world stage. Yeah. Yeah. From Wikipedia, though few major policy innovations took place during his premiership, he was able to synthesize and pass a number of measures that had reached a level of broad national support. Scholars attribute King's long tenure as party leader to his wide range of skills that were appropriate to Canada's needs. He understood the workings of capital and labor, keenly sensitive to the nuances of public policy. He was a workaholic with a shrewd and penetrating intelligence and a profound understanding of the complexities of Canadian society. End quote. Great quote. Even with a coalition government, as Canadians know can be problematic, King managed to get things done. We could talk for hours about the good that Mackenzie King did for this country, but that's for a bland history book or podcast by blathering old fonts with affected English accents. It might go something like this. We should hold Mackenzie King in reverence forevermore as a man who took Canada to the place that we see today, and blah, 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 and on and on. He did some great things for the and, country. And those are the things that get talked about. 
Yeah. We don't we don't need to reshare <laughs> these components. We did. It, we did it, but it, it, I mean the whole we don't have to go through the whole litany of great things he did. They're out there. This is dark poutine. Yeah. Dark. Yeah. There are numerous mentions of young Mackenzie King and a friend picking up Toronto prostitutes who he said in his diary that they wished to save from a life on the streets. He called the meetings heartbreaking and prayed for the salvation of these girls, and he did have some success. Oh, okay. One author, C.P. Stacy, mentioned in his book, A Very Double Life, The Private World of Mackenzie King, that King may have succumbed to the temptation of these girls mm. on more than one occasion, but he was vague in his diaries calling these outings strolls and claiming on a couple occasions that he was unable to resist temptation. Mm. But he never said exactly what he was tempted into doing. King never married. Although there are a number of women he admired and lamely pursued over the years, he fancied marrying an heiress of some vast American fortune. <laughs> the women he was drawn to were often married or in some other way unavailable to him. Hmm. When he was 65 years old, he told a confidant that he suspected he'd be forever alone. He'd never find his match. It's kind of sad. Yeah. There's a lot of interesting sad things, and the biggest thing that I find with this guy is loneliness. Yeah. Surrounded by everybody. Yeah. You know, the leader but of a country. It is not impossible to be surrounded by people, and but be yet feel alone. Yeah. He felt out of touch with the people around him, never being mm. able to connect with anyone really significantly, mm. except mm. one man. Oh, okay. He had political allies, but no other close friends, especially after the death of his roommate and best friend, Henry Albert Harper, a.k.a. Bert when King was just 27 years old. Oh. Harper perished in a futile effort trying to rescue a woman who had fallen through the ice of the frigid Ottawa River. Jeez. Four years later, King was successful in his bid to memorialize Harper with the erection of the Harper Memorial, a bronze statue of the chivalrous Arthurian knight Sir Galahad, which still stands in Ottawa next to Parliament Hill near the corner of Wellington and Metcalf Streets. I mean, what a... Uh, to perish trying to save somebody, a woman who's fallen through the ice. Like, wow. The Government of Canada website says the Harper Memorial is a monument to bravery and friendship. From Wikipedia, in 1906, Mackenzie King published a book, The Secret of Heroism, about his friend, whom he recalled in his diary entries as the man I loved as I have loved no other man, my father and brother alone accepted. In 1909, King's first speech before the House of Commons was preceded by the statement that he marked the eighth anniversary of Harper's sacrifice by placing ten white roses on the base of the statue. Hmm. King was not a great speaker like his World War II contemporaries, but he got the job done. Here's some audio of King delivering a message telling of the D-Day invasion on June 6, 1944. Hmm. So let's hear from let's Mr. That. Mr. King. At half past three o'clock this morning, the government received official word that the invasion of Western Europe had begun. Word was also received that the Canadian troops were among the Allied forces who landed this morning on the northern coast of France. Canada will be proud to learn that our troops are being supported by units of the Royal Canadian Navy and the Royal Canadian Air Force. The great landing in Western Europe is the opening of what we hope and believe will be the decisive phase of the war against Germany. The fighting is certain to be heavy, bitter, and costly. We must not expect early results. We should be prepared for local reverses as well as successes. No one can say how long this phase of the war may last. There's a lot more to that, but uh, he wasn't a great orator. Yeah, he sounds, uh, he sounded pretty, pretty tired, uh, kind of like us on the live show. 
<laughs> but he probably was pretty tired. I yes. Mean, you know, running a country's got to be exhausting, especially one at war with everybody else. Oh my god. Yeah. 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 Not a lot of time for Netflix. Not a lot of time. He was seen as bland, and one biographer, Alan Levine, said in his book, William Lyon Mackenzie King, A Life Guided by the Hand of Destiny, that many saw him as, quote, self-righteous, egotistical, petty, vain, moralistic, paranoid, selfish, self-centered, and vindictive. Wow. It was his ability to get things done that most likely kept King in power for as long as he was. Hmm. Not all his political activities can be remembered with pride. Okay. King met Adolf Hitler on June 29th, 1937. According to King's extensive diary entries for the day, he seemed impressed by the Fuhrer, finding him, quote, a man of deep sincerity. In the hour and 15 minute long meeting, originally scheduled for 45 minutes, it was Hitler who extended the meeting as he was enjoying his time with the Canadian Prime mm. Minister. King brought Hitler a current biography of his life and presented it to the man, and the two looked at photos of King's childhood. King made sure to point out that he'd grown up in Berlin, Ontario. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, instantly you throw Hitler's name out there and you get the uncomfortables. Yep. Ugh. In return, Hitler gave King, quote, a beautiful silver-mounted picture of himself, <laughs> personally inscribed, of course he did, of himself. I'm going to start doing that. I'm going to carry framed photos of me everywhere. The two did talk about war. In his diary, King wrote of Hitler, he went on to say, so far as war is concerned, you need have no fear of war at the instance of Germany. We have not desire for war. Our people don't want war, and we don't want war. Hmm. Well. So, King did manage to save a little face, stating that Canada would, in fact, stand behind Britain if she and her freedoms were ever threatened by acts of aggression by any country. Mm -hmm. Hitler indicated understanding, but again reiterated Germany's lack of desire for war. Oh. Oh. King said in his diary, quote, my sizing up of the man as I sat and talked with him was that he is really one who truly loves his fellow men and his country and would make any sacrifice for their good. Oh, you know, knowing where things went, that quote just makes me uncomfortable. Well, King left feeling he'd met a great man and that war was not in the future, but we all know how that turned out. Uh, quite the opposite. Quite. In, in every capacity. Well, there were some other things that didn't look good on Mr. King. Mm. In May of 1939, the diesel-powered ocean liner MS St. Louis left Hamburg, Germany, carrying 900 Jewish refugees, hoping to escape what was plainly coming in Germany and the rest of Europe. They were bound for Havana, Cuba. Cuba refused to allow entry to anyone without a valid U.S. visa, which meant only 22 of the 900 Jewish passengers aboard were able Ooh. to disembark. Jeez. The ship headed to Florida, where they were met by the U.S. Coast Guard before the ship made landfall, and all aboard were refused entry by U.S. President Roosevelt and his government. Well, the next logical place would be Canada, yeah. Halifax in particular. However, Mackenzie King and the Canadian government were not welcoming either. The ship was turned around and sent back to Europe and was accepted by Britain. The refugees were dispersed throughout Europe and many did not survive World War II. Not at all what we think of Canada now as this welcoming country. No. As war broke out, King fought having to use conscripts for the Canadian army. He wanted to ensure only volunteers were sent to Europe to fight for the country. Only a few were ever drafted. And according to Wikipedia, Few conscripts saw combat in Europe. Only 2,463 men reached units on the front lines, and out of those, only 69 conscripts ever lost their lives. It's still 69 too many, but yeah. Yeah, okay. And it was definitely a win and a feather in Mackenzie King's cap, Yeah, but all was not rosy. After King's death, an entry in his diary from the year previous to the MS St. Louis event revealed his own extremely problematic views about Jewish refugees and others. So this is a quote from his diary. A quote from his diary. Okay. Quote, 
A very difficult question has presented itself in Roosevelt's appeal to different countries to unite with the United States in admitting refugees from Austria, Germany, etc. That means, in a word, admitting numbers of Jews. My own feeling that nothing is to be gained by creating an internal problem in an effort to meet an international one. Mm -hmm. That we must be careful not to seek to play a role of the dog in the manger, so far as Canada is concerned, with our great open spaces and small population. We must nevertheless seek to keep this part of the continent free from unrest and from too great intermixture of foreign strains of blood. As much of the same thing lies at the basis of the Oriental problem, I fear we would have riots if we agreed to a policy that admitted numbers of Jews. Wow, how relevant is that in this day and age as well? Absolutely. Like, just ins insert Muslim yeah, or it's, Jew. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. It's almost exactly what we're hearing from other nations. And as somebody with Jewish heritage... That's kind of not fun for me to actually no. have to read about uh, our country. No, no, for sure. Wow. And that's, so that's, that's our prime minister. That's our leader. Yeah, at that time. At that time, yes. This policy also resulted in a lower number of Jewish immigrants to Canada after the liberation of the concentration camps all over Europe that were run by the Nazis. Mm -hmm. Speaking of camps... This is where things get a little difficult for oh, Canada here. Yes, I'm aware. Mackenzie King and his government also oversaw the internment of the Japanese Canadians during World War II. Mistrust for the Japanese was growing, not only after Pearl Harbor, but after there was a Japanese raid on Hong Kong that killed 800 Canadian soldiers stationed there. <sighs> From an open text bc.ca article, quote, Following Pearl Harbor, some 22,000 Canadians of Japanese descent or nationality were stripped of their property and interned under the War Measures Act. Internees' property was auctioned off or otherwise sold with no compensation to the owners. Japanese Canadians' rights were severely curtailed and at war's end, they were encouraged to either migrate to eastern Canada or choose exile to Japan. White Canadians' fears of the Japanese community were entangled in a racist notion that essentialized loyalty to the Japanese Empire, end quote. A very, very sad and dark and disgusting part of Canadian history that we had internment camps for Japanese. And again, we're seeing those it's kind of camps on of, the, yeah. around the border between Mexico and the U.S. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Many of the camps, 15 of 25, were in British Columbia, where the bulk of Japanese Canadians resided. Six more were in Ontario, and there was one each in Alberta, Quebec, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. We'll post a link to a video where lauded Canadian scientist David Suzuki narrates the experiences of Japanese families being interred during the war. He was one of them, and speaks out about his awful experience often. Mm. I love David Suzuki. From a CBC article, quote, After the war ended in 1945, Japanese Canadians were offered a choice to be deported to Japan, a defeated country unknown to most, or to resettle in eastern Canada. In 1949, when Mackenzie King was no longer in power, four years after the war was over, Japanese Canadians were finally given back full citizenship rights, so it took four years. <sighs> including the right to vote and the right to return to the West Coast. So they couldn't even vote for those four years. After almost 40 years, 40 years, 40, four, zero. Prime Minister Brian Mulroney formally apologized to Japanese Canadian survivors and their families on September 22, 1988. Art Miki of the National Association of Japanese Canadians called the apology and $300 million compensation package a settlement that heals. The $300 million compensation package included $21,000 for each of the 13,000 survivors, mm. $12 million for a Japanese community fund, and $24 million to create a Canadian Race Relations Foundation to ensure such discrimination never happens again, end quote. Mm. And so that's there again is that 
we want to make this right yeah. so this never happens again here. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, <sighs> what was the motivation for 40 years? That Was it money? Was it oh. that they wanted... I, 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 this is a horrible thing to think about, but was it that they wanted to ensure that enough people had died that they could afford to pay them off? You know, it's really difficult to know exactly why. I, I think, personally, another huge component of it is not wanting to acknowledge and address that we did something horrible and terrible. But what is the motivation for that? If it's a government, it is typically financially related. I, I'm sure finances had to play a role in there. But I think also, again, uh, it's... In uh, King's Diary on August 6, 1945, a very well-remembered day, King gave his thoughts on the use of the atomic bomb on the people of Hiroshima. Quote, We now have seen what might have come to the British race had German scientists won the race. And he means the race for the bomb. It is fortunate that the use of the bomb should have been upon Japanese rather than upon the white races of Europe. Oh, God, that makes me very uncomfortable. Right. Again, we've talked at the beginning different times, but it doesn't make this okay. No, that it, one phrase, white races of Europe, yeah. really does kind of stand out sharply. It, it gives me shivers. I don't feel comfortable with it. Uh, it makes me embarrassed for our country that at a point in time this was said yeah privately yeah but still but that, still, that's that was, was the belief of our leader and that yeah that's what was driving his decisions I, I don't know why i mean i constantly in my head i'm constantly trying to say a different time different time but i don't like saying that because it, it almost excuses that's right the actions and there's no excuse for for that kind of thinking almost immediately following his death the stories of Mackenzie King's eccentricities began to surface, and after the full release of his diaries, Canadians willing to look were stunned by what they found. We'll get into more after this break. Just a few weeks after King's death, the stories about the great Prime Minister's secret involvement in occult practices began to surface. King had been in contact with many mediums of the day, seeking advice, even claiming to have communicated with the spirit of the late Queen Victoria. Wow, okay. While living, he maintained public silence on his views of the afterlife, but he would, only to those closest, talk of life beyond death and even about communication with the dead. Some of his closest confidants and personal staff participated in Ouija board sessions at King's Ottawa home, but all this was kept secret. Historians had plenty to search through in King's home. From Christopher Dummett's book, Unbuttoned, A History of Mackenzie King's Secret Life, quote, Mackenzie King didn't throw things away. He left his house stuffed with letters and notes and memoranda and reports. Whole rooms in the basement of Laurier House, his Ottawa residence, now a museum, were devoted to filing cabinets. He never seemed to have thrown away even a Christmas card. Yeah, I think I, in some regard, can relate. Yeah. One item of note in his home was a crystal ball on an ornate stand believed to have been used in divination. Oh, man, I want a crystal ball. In 1951, Blair Fraser from McLean's Magazine, Canada's Answer to Time, learned of King's communication with a medium and published a story on him on December 15, 1951. It was titled The Secret Life of Mackenzie King, Spiritualist. Mm -mm. And its subtitle reads, For 25 years, Canada's famous Prime Minister was a practicing spiritualist. He believed that through mediums, he had communicated with his mother, Franklin D. Roosevelt, and even his dog, Pat, after they had died. Here, for the first time, is revealed the best-kept secret of Mr. King's amazing career. Okay, yeah, I mean, uh, just as a regular dude, I'm like, you know, cool, good for you, man. Good for you. Uh... But could you imagine, like, hearing news of Trudeau doing, having seances and Look, like crystal ball and, like, serious yeah, about looking it? Looking at tea leaves and yeah, astrology. No, uh, yeah, complete. Like, it's just, yeah. Like, that's a very, like, mm -hmm. a a any leader, again, if you hear that, you'd kind of be like, oh, okay, hmm. 
and again though different times right it was more well I, well sci- science wasn't where it is now and so beliefs were very different about uh after life and, and and whatnot but still that it's pretty it was bonkers still, to think of prime ministers holding séances and ouija board sessions in the right parliament well not in parliament in his home well in parliament that would have been a whole different thing than <laughs> That would have been like <laughs> even more wackadoo. I don't know. I this think, is pretty wackadoo. I still think it's pretty cuckoo, uh, even in his private residence. King had been writing his memoirs at the time of his death, and that tome went unfinished. His diaries that he'd kept from the age of 19 until he died at 75 contained extensive and detailed entries of the late Prime Minister's deepest thoughts and beliefs, some of which we've heard. Yep. The few diary entries already mentioned are definitely interesting, if only to reveal King's thoughts on race and war. Yeah. But there was plenty more to come. Some archivists close to King and his writings and other groups sought to keep much of what the PM wrote out of the public eye. They didn't want to sully the name of a great Canadian. Mm, okay. King himself had one of the diaries destroyed upon his death, but King's wishes were not executed. The public interest won out and King's diaries began to be released. Interesting. I can't imagine that being a practice now. It still happens. Look at Nixon's tapes and all that kind of stuff. And but those are a lot. Well, but some those, of that was his private thoughts. But it was done in, in the uh, Oval Office, which is still on, you know. Yeah. yeah it, it just it, it just find it fascinating that, I mean, I'm glad they were released. Just fascinating. As more details emerged, so did an unkind nickname. Some began calling King Weird Willie. <laughs> I have that nickname for something else. In 1976, when author and history professor C.P. Stacy released his controversial book, A Very Double Life, The Private World of Mackenzie King, Canadians got a real glimpse into King's private world. Mm. King had consulted a fortune teller in Toronto when he was 22. She told him some, quote, strange truths, according to a diary entry in May of 1896. Oh, okay. King, a lifelong Christian, initially struggled with the idea of spiritual communication, saying these things were unknowable. Mm-hmm. King went through a number of deaths of his closest family members over seven years. His sister Bella passed in 1915, his father in 1916, his mother in 1917, and his brother Max in 1922. He mourned them deeply, and it is believed that loneliness and a deep desire to reconnect with his family drew him toward these odd practices. You know, I get that. That that makes some sense. And look at the time. That's a lot of people to pass in, in a close family to pass such a time span. But, it, you know, again, it's a very different time. Medical uh, techniques are very... Look, just watch the neck. Yeah. And you'll understand how it was easy to perish from curable things now. Yeah, live from a cold. Yeah, exactly. In Calgary on October 13th, 1920, King had his palm read by a Syrian fortune teller. He wrote in his diary that she was, quote, pure fake, but some amusement. So he didn't always believe in it. Yeah, yeah. King obsessively recorded his dreams and later trying to interpret what symbols in his dream might signify in the way of messages to him. Okay. In March of 1925, he connected with a medium from Kingston, Ontario, named Rachel Blaney. She claimed that she was able to... She claimed she was able to see and was communicating with the spirits of his mother and his brother Max beyond the veil. Mm. King met with Blaney in October of that year. She interpreted King's dreams as he'd asked and correctly predicted King's election in 1926. Mm. Mrs. Blaney was his go-to medium over the next few years, but she fell out of favor when she was unable to predict King's election loss in 1930 after telling him she saw him winning handily. So she was right once, but not right the next time. From Alan Levine's book, King, William Lyon Mackenzie King, A Life Guided by the Hand of Destiny, quote, King was fascinated by his convoluted dreams of waiting endlessly for trains, floating in the air, and meeting the dead and forgotten. He had an obsessive compulsive fixation with numbers and position of the hands on the clock. He saw magical images in tea leaves in what must rank at the top of his bizarrest of the bizarre category, the mysterious shapes formed in his shaving cream lather, end quote. (laughs) So his shaving cream was sending him messages. It's like... uh, That I believe. 
Carol said that one lady she was talking to one time said that a piece of uh, lemon meringue pie was talking to her as the old god. Well, that happens to me often, it's like, except for the fact that pie is saying, eat me. Yeah, eat, eat me. That's pretty much all I ever hear from a piece of pie. <laughs> eat me. King participated in a seance in 1932, directed by a well-known medium at the time. The medium channeled voices of King's dead relatives. He was especially pleased to hear from his mother and grandfather. Speaking through the medium, King also heard from former Canadian Prime Minister Sir Wilfrid Laurier and his close friend, Bert Harper. Okay. All right. So our, our Prime Minister is talking to the dead. As well as the use of a spirit board, King also learned a technique of communicating with spirits through, quote, table wrapping. He didn't need to employ a medium for these sessions and could reach out to the great beyond anytime he liked. Table wrapping. Okay. Yeah, that's what I figured. Like, not, not but, yeah, like Morse code. Yeah, I guess so. Like huh? two knocks for yes and one knock for no. Oh, yeah, yeah. Communicating with his mother, even hearing her voice in visions and dreams, gave solace to the lonely politician. He was happy to know she was there for him still when he needed her. Well, okay, so, but he, seeing people and hearing voices, uh, their voices in dreams, yeah, th those are dreams. That's what happens in dreams. At one point he wrote, with God's help, and her guidance from beyond, I believe I will be able to do better. I am sure of her existence in the great beyond and that she and Max and Belle and Father do guide and care for me, but I fear that I often make it hard for their spirits to reach and touch mine. May God grant closer communion with the kingdom of heaven." Hmm. End quote. Mm -hmm. And I get where he's coming from in the sense of uh, loss. So if you've lost some, a lot of you people want to that you somewhere. Yeah, exactly. So I can get wanting to cling on and try to rationalize the kookiness. These things did color his perceptions, though, oh, politically. They did, eh? yeah. In 1938, Hitler was busy making trouble in Europe. Uh, King believed things would turn out positively. Ooh. He knew that Hitler also was a spiritualist. Like King, Hitler sought guidance from his dead mother. <sighs> King wrote, quote, No one who does not understand this relationship, the worship of the highest purity in a mother, can understand this power to be derived therefrom, or the guidance. I believe the world will yet come to see a very great man in Hitler. Oh, no. Slightly off the mark. Oh, wow. Slightly off the mark. Gigantically yeah. off. Wow. Talk about a miss. Ooh. Even with his failings. Oh, mm. <laughs> just a very great man in Hitler. Like that just, Even with his failings and eccentricities, William Lyon Mackenzie King did see Canadians through the horrors of World War II. Mm -hmm. William Lyon Mackenzie King retired in 1948 after being replaced as the liberal leader by Louis St. Laurent. King continued to believe in the afterlife into his dying days. His last entry into his diary was just two days before he passed away. Mackenzie King died on July 22, 1950, after a bout with pneumonia. He was buried in Toronto's Mount Pleasant Cemetery. The story of Mackenzie King does not end with his death, though. Oh. In an article by Mackenzie King's friend, fellow spiritualist and newspaper man Percy J. Phillip told CBC Radio in 1954 and The Nation, mm -hmm. learned of Phillip's claim of a visit from the ghost of Mackenzie King four years after his death on a bench near King's home in Kingsmere near Ottawa. Okay now. He claimed the two discussed politics, some of King's regrets, and how people's post-mortem perception had amused him. And, oh, okay. The newspapers Philip submitted the story to did not want to pick it up, but in 1955, Fate magazine printed it in its entirety. Fate magazine, never heard of it. Fate is, it's still around and it's all about paranormal and oh, okay. weird things. It is said that Mackenzie House, today a museum, to William Lyon Mackenzie, King's grandfather, the one he'd communicated with via mediums, mm -hmm. is haunted. Interesting. Let's hope so. It's a museum that has shown signs of haunting that began around the 1950s in the early years after Mackenzie King's death. I want to believe. 
Here's a Global News Toronto story told by some museum workers. This is the home of William Lyne Mackenzie. He was the first mayor of Toronto. And in 1837, he led a rebellion here to overthrow British rule. He moved into this house in 1859. In August of 1861, Mackenzie dies in his home, and 12 years later, his wife Isabel dies. By the 1940s, the house was on its way to becoming a museum. And that's when the ghost stories begin. By the 1950s, live-in caretakers were working and living in Mackenzie House Museum. One of the caretakers, Mrs. Edmonds, one night claimed she was awoken by a soft touch on the shoulder. She opened her eyes and said there was a lady there bending over the bed, looking at her, who then vanished. A few weeks later, Mrs. Edmonds claimed it happened again. But this time, Mrs. Edmonds said, the lady drew back her hand and slapped her in the face before vanishing. And this got the stories into all the newspapers in Canada in 1960. Remember, William Lyon Mackenzie was a journalist. He had a newspaper called The Colonial Advocate. The printing press behind me in the past has been known to operate of its own volition late at night. The sounds of people walking up and down the stairs here. It's a creaky old house. So anybody walking up and down that stairs will be noticed. Apparently, some nights, the piano plays on its own. In 1960, this house was donated to the city of Toronto. Part of this bequest was an inventory of all the artifacts that were in the house at that time, and at the bottom of this list were the words, One Ghost. An archdeacon was then brought in to perform a blessing on this house, and perhaps calm the restlessness that was here then. But. Was it successful? The staff don't sleep here at night anymore, so if there are ghosts, after dark, the museum belongs to them. Perhaps that regal brick home at 82 Bond Street, erected in the 1850s, is the family gathering place of King and his grandparents in their afterlife. One of them is slapping people. <laughs> yeah. Many a ghost tour in Toronto makes this a regular stop on their walkabouts. I would imagine so. You'd have to. That would be necessary. So that's it for this week's story of huh. uh, William Lyne Mackenzie King. A little bit of a, a strange guy. Yeah. I mean, ooh, it, yeah, some of the things that he wrote were disturbing. in his diary were very disturbing. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know why I'm constantly trying to rationalize it. Well, they were just, you know, it was private. He didn't really let it carry through, but then, well, no, you've got Japanese internment camps. Yeah. You know, which yep. is was solely just a race yep. related. And I'm sure we would find the same thing again about uh, other issues in our country. That, oh, yeah. That, you know, we should be embarrassed about. I think if you look into the history of uh, damn near every country, there's going to be some pretty disturbing things you learn yep. about its origins or people leading it. But, uh, yeah, I, I had no idea of any of this stuff. But ours is the only one we should really be concerned about because we're the only one that can we can do anything about, so. Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, and this is about us learning a bit about our history. Yeah. And some of the disgusting things in it. Yeah. Well, and some of the interesting things. The, I, it, I think the spiritualism is actually more interesting than I it think is that's fascinating. disturbing. Yeah. Disturbing. No, absolutely. Uh, it's Always, because again, we have this vision of, of our leaders. We have this vision of them as just like the top of the top. Well, I guess we used to have that feeling. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's intrinsically, we feel odd about hearing our, about a leader talking to the dead, believing that he's talking to the dead, believing that he's communicating with them. They're out there slapping people. Yeah. You know, it, it's just a fascinating, I find that part fascinating, but the, oh. Yeah, the the uh, actual decisions that got made about, uh, the, the racial decisions that got made are disturbing. And hearing his praise of Hitler. Yeah. I mean, granted, a lot of that was before things really escalated. But he was aware of what was going on at that time, too. Especially in the later 
mm-hmm. in, in the later entries for yep. sure when he's trying to say like um yeah uh, he's still going to do great things yep it's like oh no 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 so before we go we want to give some shout outs to our patreon patrons shout it out our, this week's good eggs are miriam cloutier of Souk, BC. I wonder if she's related to Dan Cloutier. Oh, Souk. I was just looking up Souk the other day. I went, I'm thinking about going back there. I went to the Souk potholes. You didn't, you didn't make a comment about Dan Cloutier, though. I, well, I because you did. Because the beach ball behind him. I, I, still, I still think fondly of, of Cloutier. Yeah. Sarah Touchette of Kansas City, Missouri. Hey, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cade Bengert, and she is from... Watasquin in Alberta. I like Watasquin, ne- the name Watasquin. Never heard it, and it's pretty great. Scones Fauntleroy McDougall. Which might so, be the best name I've ever heard. So I think we have to say it. Scones Fauntleroy McDougall. Oh, absolutely. From yeah. San Jose, California. Not there's where a, I was expecting. There's another name here, but I think that that person wants to remain anonymous by yeah, using yeah. Scones Fauntleroy McDougall. No, that's that. That is it. I. That should be your name. That should be everybody's name. Everybody should legally change their name to that because that's great. From San Jose. Oh, San Jose. Not again, not at all where I was expecting a font, Lori. Nora Schild from Pleasanton, California. Oh. I read things wrong. You did. Pleasanton. Yeah. Well, with it, I mean, it sounds just damn pleasant. Dayton Chan. From Surrey, BC. Yeah, yeah. I've seen him around the Yumber Yard and stuff. Nice enough fella. Thanks, Dayton. Yeah, thank you very much, Dayton. Ashley Dringenberg from Iona, Michigan. Oh, Iona, Michigan. Do you get it? You get yes. It? Iona, Michigan. I got to own it. And Kate from uh-huh. the Ignorance Was Bliss podcast. Hey. Thanks for the support, Kate. Kate, we appreciate that. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias. And Kate is going to be coming to... Uh, the West Coast from she's she lives in Salem, mm-hmm. and she she yeah she did one of our uh, our ghost stories for us on our ghost I story remember, episode, yes. and she's going to be coming to Washington State, and hopefully we'll be able to meet her. Oh, I really point. like that. Yeah, that would be great. So Kate from Ignorance Was Bless the podcast. Check it out, Go folks. Have a listen. Check it out. Pronto. Nicole Annette from Burnaby, BC. Yeah, another local. Oh, another sweet. local. Hey, Nicole. Hope you're doing well out there in Burnaby. Burnaby. Jaden McGillis from Grand Prairie, Alberta. Oh, hi, Jason. Thank you. Jaden. Oh, hi, Jaden. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm the one who's supposed to screw up names, not you. Yeah, and an easy one like Jaden. Yeah, whatever. And this one is prena- is spelled P H O E. So is it Foey or Foe? I would. Phew, it's I would not think, pho. I would think pho. Pho. Okay. Pho Boudreaux from Edmonton, Alberta. Oh my God, that's just like the sibilance in there is beautiful. Sibilance. Sibilance. Okay. Pho Boudreaux. Pho Boudreaux. Amy Driscoll from Palm Coast, Florida. Hey, thanks, Amy. Thank you so much. And Erica Hatchie from. Somewhere in the wilds of New Brunswick. Oh, the Brunswick of the New. Looks like Rishabukto Road. I've never heard of. No, you wouldn't have heard of it because you're not from. I'm I'm not, no. So there you go. Those are those good eggs. Oh, thank you all. Like, seriously. It means a lot that you're all just like. Supporting, supporting the show. Like, it's, oh, we so appreciate it. Maybe one day we can survive just off of this. <laughs> that would be nice. I don't know if that's going to happen. Yeah, well. We did get some donut money from some people who appreciate what we do. So from Vanessa Vadnell, she says, I recently started listening and love the show. You guys are great storytellers. I especially love the Houdini episode. Mm. Vanessa, San Diego, California. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you. And we're glad you enjoy it. Yeah, and and I was thinking that no one would like that Houdini no, episode I, when I, I loved did it. it. I dug but, it. But it was kind of fun. Yeah. And Anna Fredrickson, she sent us some donut money to cover the donut money that we had to send back because she saw my interaction oh, on the Yumber Yard. How sweet is that? And that was very nice. And she says, we have to share this donut money with Carol, which is exactly what we do anyway. Yeah. No. Carol does get a share of the donut money because she helps with the show a lot. Yeah. So there you go. Well, thanks, uh, folks. Thanks. Again, again, it just means the world to us. 
Thanks so much to our patrons past and present for your pledges. We really appreciate your support of the show. If you want to help support us, you can do so at patreon.com slash darkpoutine or for a one-time support, you can send us donut money via PayPal at our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. Best not to send like uh, corrections or anything like that there because like honestly... <laughs> <laughs> it's going out the window. Well, we're not going to do, we're going to, unless it's something really yeah. e- egregious, Yeah, we're not going to correct ourselves. And it has to be more than one or two emails that tell us that because we do get a lot of email every week. Because this is who we are. We're, we're not um, polished. And we're just riffing. We're riffing. Yeah. We're riffing. And so uh, there's going to be lots uh, of inaccuracies probably from me. <laughs> Definitely. And I mean, some of the research that I do is probably going to be flawed too. I'm not, like I mentioned, we're not journalists. You do your due diligence and I, I, I can confidently stand behind your research, but there's never a guarantee that a source, no matter how reputable, is accurate and well, whatnot as well. Even science is just a theory. <laughs> right. If you don't already, it would mean a lot to us if you subscribe to the show. You can easily find us on iTunes, Podcast, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, or wherever you get your on-demand audio. Check out darkpoutine.com for show notes and other cool stuff. Uh, like I mentioned, we'll have that link to the David Suzuki conversation yes. uh, about Japanese internment, which is really fascinating. Please give us a follow or a like on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Dark Poutine. Most importantly, tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. Uh, It's our biggest resource. Exactly. And what we want to hit on most is if you're listening today and it's Canada Day, drive safe. Yes. Remember, don't uh, drive drunk or high. Oh, God, please. On Canada Day. It's the first Canada Day that you can legally smoke weed. Yeah. So... I mean, partake in whatever you want to partake in, but stay off the roads. Yeah. Please, please. There's good eggs. My, my, do not run over people drunk or high. No, it's one of the things I have zero tolerance for. Our outro will be a little different this week. Oh, will it now? You'll hear some music from a service that we use. Mm -hmm. And I just searched for Canada and I found some interesting stuff. So it's a little different this week. So enjoy. Get your dancing pants on. Get your dancing pants on. Don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye-bye, everybody. Chowder. Toodles. Toodles. There's ghosts in the in Parliament. And there's slime.